the organizers of the uh, geometry webinar. Uh, let me welcome uh, Spiro Karigianis from the University of Waterloo in Canada, telling us about higher dimensional chrome of compactness in G2 and spin seven manifolds as a goal. As a goal, definitely. We're not, we're not. <laughs> Okay, and thank you, Enrique. Thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to, to be there virtually today. Um, so I'm going to talk about joint work with Chang and Jesse Madnick, who I believe are both in the audience. So if there's a question that I can't answer, then hopefully one of them can. Um, it's going to appear in the Asian Journal, and this is the archive number if you want to take a look. So I, I probably have more than I can do in 50 minutes, um, but if I don't get necessarily to the to the complete statements of our theorems by the end of the talk it's okay because i really want you to understand which theorems we're generalizing so i'll talk more than almost half the time about sort of classical simple results in symplectic geometry from the 80s and 90s uh, and then i'll talk about the setting to which we're going to generalize these vector cross products on Riemannian manifolds and then by the end if we're running out of time i'm just going to show you quickly the Theorems we proved are basically almost exactly the same in this in this higher setting with some minor tweaks because the equations get a little less well behaved in this uh, generalized setting. So don't you know don't panic when you see the 38 at the bottom right there. It's uh, it's not going to be so bad. Okay, so uh, as I said, we're going to start with the motivation from classical symplectic geometry. I'm not going to give any names here because I don't know all the names uh, but if you're if you want to if you want to find um, sources for all this the book by Macduff and Salomon either of the books by Macduff and Salomon will have all the the names you need to see here okay and I know that most of you know uh, about uh, g structures on manifolds so I'll go I'll go through this a little quickly at first so let's start with a compact symplectic manifold so omega is our symplectic form and and compatible almost complex structure on this manifold. So that means that uh, that J is tamed by omega and that they're compatible in this sense. Um, and of course, there are lots of such almost complex structures given a fixed symplectic structure. And almost all of them, of course, are not going to be integrable. So we don't need to talk about integrability of J here. Um, and from, from this pair, from J and omega, we get a Riemannian metric. I'm going to call it H rather than G because there's going to be another Riemannian manifold which will have a metric G. Um, and this is how to get H from omega and J. And then conversely, you can write omega in terms of H and J in the usual way. So this, this triple is called almost Kähler structure because J doesn't have to be integrable, uh, but omega is closed. We started with omega closed, so it's almost Kähler. Now, in this setting of an almost Kähler manifold, we have distinguished submanifolds. So this UM structure determines a distinguished class of, we, we get these in all even dimensions, but I'm only going to talk about the real dimension two submanifolds. So um, if we take a submanifold of real dimension two, we call it almost complex, or sometimes I'll just say complex for short, if uh, the tangent vectors to that submanifold are um, sent to tangent vectors again by j. So j leaves the tangent space of L invariant. And because j is an orthogonal transformation, it'll obviously leave the normal space invariant as well. So that's a distinguished class of real dimension two submanifolds. And in this case, it's not hard to see that if you had such a submanifold, then it's orientable. And there's a choice of orientation on that submanifold so that the Kähler form omega restricts to exactly the volume form, right? This is the volume form coming from this chosen orientation and the restrict, restricted metric, the induced metric. So we say, of course, that L is calibrated with respect to this closed form omega, if you know what calibrations are, and probably many of you do if you've been coming to this seminar. Um, so it's a calibrated submanifold, uh, and it follows that L is absolutely volume minimizing in its homology class. This is the fundamental theorem of calibrated geometry. So we do need the fact that omega is closed for this statement. We don't need j to be integrable. Okay, so that's a distinguished class of submanifolds. We also have a distinguished class of maps into this almost Kähler manifold. So let's talk about these j-holomorphic maps. So 
we start with a compact oriented two manifold. So we fix an orientation uh, on it and a conformal structure. So, so we all know that an oriented real two manifold with a conformal structure is a Riemann surface. Okay? But I'm not going to think of it as a Riemann surface because when we generalize this to higher dimensions in the second half of the talk, it's going to be this structure that generalizes the orientation and the conformal structure. So this is this is my my uh, statement here. So an orientation and a conformal structure is a CO plus two R structure, and there's this nice low dimensional uh, isomorphism that happens that that shows you that this is GL one C. That's why one of these structures is the same as uh, as a complex structure. Um, now let's look at the Hodge star operator of sigma. So we we have a well we have a conformal class of metrics and we have an orientation. So if we just had a metric and an orientation, we would get a Hodge star which goes from t sigma to t sigma. But it's easy to check that from one forms to one forms in in real dimension two, the Hodge star is conformally invariant. So even though we only have a conformal class of Riemannian metrics, we still get a well defined Hodge star. And this thing squares to minus one. And in fact, this is this is the J uh, on sigma, which makes this a Riemann surface. Okay, so uh, basically, sigma is a Riemann, the compact Riemann surface. But instead of thinking of J as, as an almost complex structure, I'm thinking of J as the Hodge star on T sigma for for the conf the unique conformal class of metrics that corresponds to J and that orientation. Okay. So here's the definition of a J-holomorphic map. So we have our compact oriented two manifold with a conformal class of metrics. And we have our almost scalar manifold. We're going to look at a smooth map between these two. Uh, then du, the differential will take sections of T sigma to sections of the pullback by U of Tm. And we want, we say that U is a J-holomorphic map if this equation holds. So if you first apply du, that's going to take you from t sigma to, to this bundle. Then I can apply j here on each fiber. Uh, and we want this to be the same as first applying star sigma, which will take us from here back to, to here again, and then applying du. Okay, so this equation makes sense. Both sides are mapping between the same two spaces. And as I said, if you think of star sigma as just being uh, j, this is just saying that du j is equal to j du. Okay, so this is just the Cauchy Riemann equation generalized to this setting. As I said, I'm writing it in this slightly non standard way in terms of the star sigma, which is the same as j sigma, only because when we get to the, the more general setting in the second half, this is the way it's going to be. There's not going to be a j. Okay, so that's a, that's a special class of maps into this almost Kähler manifold. So let's look at, this is a PDE, of course, uh, for you, for this map. Let's look at what it looks like in local coordinates, if you like looking at things in local coordinates. So this map, even though it looks linear here in DU, it's actually nonlinear because the J over here is evaluated at the point U of X. So in local coordinates, um, I'm again writing it in this slightly uh, non-standard way. If I uh, multiply both sides by H inverse, then the H inverse omega here would give me the J on on uh, m and this mu uh, is the volume form on sigma so mu with the g inverse g is the metric on sigma this gives you the hodge star on sigma and in fact remember we only had a conformal class of metrics on sigma but it's easy to see that this left hand side is conformally invariant right if you take uh, g lower indices and you replace it by lambda squared g then then this mu will get uh, changed by a lambda to minus two and sorry the, the mu will get changed by also by a lambda squared, but this uh, will get a lambda to the minus two. So this combination, uh, mu lower g upper, is conformally invariant. Okay, so again, I took a, a very simple, let me go back, a very simple equation, and I wrote it in a much more complicated way than we're used to, because when we get to the, the more general setting, this is really the way, is that this is going to be the easiest, the simplest way to write it. Okay, um, so, so this is the equation, the J-holomorphic map equation. Uh, let's look at some geometric properties of this equation, of solutions to this equation, and then we'll look at some analytic properties, which is what we're going to try to generalize to this, this other setting. 
So geometric properties of J-holomorphic maps. Um, so first of all, the equation is invariant under pre-composition by orientation preserving conformal diffeomorphisms. And so if U is a solution to that equation and F is a, is a diffeomorphism of sigma which preserves the orientation and the conformal class, then uh, U compose F is another solution. This is not hard to check. But there's another way in which conformal geometry plays a role in the story, which is the following. If you have a J-holomorphic map, then you can show that the pullback of the target metric is conformal to the initial metric, um, and the conformal factor is exactly uh, the, the energy, the two energy density, right? The norm squared of du. So again, we don't really have a metric on sigma. We just have a conformal class of metrics. And this norm of du squared is computed with the choice of a metric. But it's easy to see, it's easy to check that if you change g by conformal factor, then of course the norm of du squared will change and the two factors exactly cancel each other out. So this combination, norm of du squared times g sigma, doesn't depend on the choice of representative of the conformal class. Okay, so what does this mean? The pullback of h is a multiple of g. It means that this map is what's called weakly conformal because this factor here could vanish, right? Uh, but when it doesn't, it means that it's a conformal map. So at each point in the domain, either du vanishes at that point, or if it doesn't, then du at that point is a conformal injection, right? It maps the uh, tangent space of sigma injectively into, uh, into the tangent space of M uh, with a conform uh, and, and conformal with respect to the metrics. Okay, so conformal geometry shows up in these two different contexts here. Can I ask a and question? Both, yes. What happens if U is harmonic? Uh, I'm going to talk about the relation to harmonic. Ah, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so this, this set of points where uh, DU vanishes is called the critical locus of this uh, map. And uh, one can show that this is actually a discrete set of points. So it's finite when sigma is compact. Uh, it's non-trivial. But if we ignore, ignore these bad points, these critical points, and you just look at the, the rest of sigma, then the image, it's going to, this is going to be, this U is an immersion on sigma minus sigma C. So this image is an almost complex of manifold. So we're tying back to the previous slide. So these special maps have images when, when they're nice, because they're not always nice, but when the images are nice, the, the images are these nice are these special submanifolds in this context, the almost complex submanifolds. Now to, to uh, uh, I'm going to get to Enrique's question in the next slide. So there's something called the energy identity. Um, so this is for any smooth map from sigma to M. One can compute that point-wise, if you pull back omega by U, it's less than or equal to norm of du squared times vol sigma with this factor of a half. And again, this right-hand side, to compute each of these independently, you need a particular choice of representative of the conformal class, but the combination of the two together is independent of the choice of representative. Okay, so we have this inequality point-wise, and equality occurs if and only if U is J-holomorphic. So this is just linear algebra. It's essentially the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality and the fact, and, and Verdinger's inequality, the fact that omega is a calibration. Um, I'm not going to, and when I get to the, the more general energy identity in the second half, if you do want to see the proof, I actually have a slide for that proof, so Enrique can ask me after the talk if he wants to see it. Um, so this is the energy identity. Why is it called the energy identity? Well, you'll see in, in a minute. We're assuming omega is closed here, so in fact, if you take u star of omega and integrate over sigma, this is a topological topological number. So what do I mean by that? We're assuming that there, our manifolds have no boundary. So this integral of u star omega over sigma is just a topological thing. It's just the pairing of the cohomology class of omega with the homology class of the image of sigma, the, the homology class represented by the image of sigma. Okay. So in other words, if you're looking only, omega is closed, so the, so the class of omega is well-defined. If you're looking only at uh, at maps u 
whose image lies in the same homology class of M, then uh, this number will be the same for all of them, right? So if I integrate both sides of this, the left-hand side will be, will be a topological quantity, and the right-hand side is just the uh, one-half the L2 norm. It's just the energy, okay? That's why this is called an energy identity. So, um, so this is answering uh, Enrique's question. So by the energy identity, a J-holomorphic map will minimize the two energy in its homology class. So this is the, I guess I should put a, a one half here. Uh, there should be a one half there. It doesn't matter, it still minimizes this without the one half, but the two energy usually has the one half there. So this is a, this is just the, the two energy of a, of a map and uh, J-holomorphic maps are minimizers of this two energy in this class. So in particular, they're, that means they're local minimizers. Of course, they may not be global minimizers over all maps, but in the homology class, they're minimizers, and therefore, they're critical points. So they satisfy the, the Euler-Lagrange equation. So a J-holomorphic map is a harmonic map, okay? Um, this, is the, this is the Euler-Lagrange equations for the two energy. Uh, it's the harmonic map equation. And what, we, what I've just said is that any J-holomorphic map is harmonic, of course, not every harmonic map has to be J holomorphic. Is that is that what you were asking me, Enrique? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this harmonic map equation is second order now, uh, and nonlinear, but it's quasi-linear. Okay. Remember, we went from the J holomorphic map equation, which is first order. It's first order, but it's it's nonlinear. Uh, it's quasi-linear, and now we get a second order. Uh, quasi-linear equation. So any J-holomorphic map is, is harmonic, uh, but when we get to the higher, the, the, the more general setting in the second half of the talk, we're going to again have a special first-order equation whose solutions are automatically solutions of a second-order equation, but now the first-order equation is going to be fully nonlinear, although the second-order equation will still be quasi-linear. Okay. So, so why do we care about these J-holomorphic maps, right? The reason there was so much study of them in the, in the past 30 years or, long, or more is, is because you can construct invariants of the symplectic manifold by counting appropriately, I put this in quotation marks, counting J-holomorphic maps. So these are called the gromov witten invariants. So there's a lot that goes into this phrase appropriately counting. You can teach a whole course on it for, for months. As I said, you can look at the book by Macduff Solomon if you're interested. But the point is, if you look at these J holomorphic maps in, a, in the right way, count them in the right way, whatever that means, you get, uh, you get a number, you get an invariant. Uh, it's actually more complicated than just a number. It's, it's they're, they're, they're cohomology classes in some sense. But, uh, but this, this, this invariant you get is independent of the choice of the compatible J. So it's really an invariant of the symplectic structure. I'm not going to tell you anything about how to do this, but what we care about is, you know, what is the analysis that goes into properly defining these gromov of witten invariants? In order to, to get a, a, be able to define them in the right way, you really need to, 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 to um, have a notion that the space of all these J-holomorphic maps up to some notion of, of equivalence is compact in some sense. So it's not too big and you, you can count things. Basically, what it means to construct a virtual class, um, but in order to to have good compactness properties for this space, you really need to know what happens if you have a sequence which is bounded in some sense. Does it have a convergent subsequence in some sense? Right, that would be some kind of compactness. What is the what kind of bad things can happen to to a sequence of a bounded sequence of J holomorphic maps? Does it always end up converging in in, in a um, up to a subsequence to some J holomorphic map? So this is what I'm saying here. In order to understand the compactness properties of the space, you need to understand the ways in which a sequence of J-holomorphic maps can degenerate or develop singularities. So there's a whole bunch of analytic results for J-holomorphic maps. I'm going to list seven of them. As I said, you can look in, in Macduff Salomon to see who these are, are due to. Um, what we do in our, in our papers, we prove these seven theorems again in a more general setting, which is what we're going to talk about next. So let me just uh, state these results. So there's a mean value inequality. Basically says that um, if you're on a small ball in, in the domain sigma, 
if the if the two energy is sufficiently small, so there exists some epsilon naught and c such that if the two energy on a small ball is is smaller than epsilon naught, then you can control the soup norm of du, the c zero norm, by this uh, two energy on this ball. It's called a mean value inequality. Okay, so I'm going to give you a bunch of analytic results. They're they're interesting in their own right if you like you know analysis of geometric PDEs, but but these are all useful to to being able to properly define a compactification of the space of J holomorphic maps, which I'm not going to get into. Okay. So that's one result. Another result is interior regularity. So if you have a map in an appropriate Sobolev space that satisfies the J holomorphic map equation almost everywhere, then it in fact has to be C infinity. It's based on an elliptic equation. Uh, it's uniformly elliptic. You'll see. You'll see though that in the in the next setting, in the generalized setting, it's it's degenerate elliptic. It won't be uniformly elliptic. So this particular result will change. Most of the theorems I'm going to show you at the end of the talk, the only change is going to be that a bunch of twos become ends, right? Where two is the dimension of the domain, they'll become ends. But there's going to be some more technical changes because of the fact that the equations are no longer uniformly elliptic, they're degenerate. And one of the changes, for example, will be here. We're not going to get C infinity. OK, so some more results. There's a removable singularities theorem. So if you have a smooth map on a punctured, punctured disk, which is J-holomorphic, and if the two energy on this punctured disk is finite, then you can actually extend it to the whole disk. You can extend it to the, to the origin to get a smooth J-holomorphic map. So this is very similar to the removable singularities for Yang-Mills fields. There's an energy gap. So there's here we're looking at S2 with the, the round, the, the conformal class of the round metric. So there's this uh, magic number epsilon naught that depends on the geometry of S2 and, and uh, I guess M as well, so that every J holomorphic map from S2 into M whose energy is less than this threshold has to be constant. Constant maps, of course, are du is zero, so the equation is satisfied. Um, so this energy gap tells us that if you have a non-trivial solution, a non-constant solution from the round two sphere, it has to have a certain minimum two energy. Okay. Spiro, can I just ask one thing? Yep. Do Do you establish the energy gap by the um, by a similar procedure to harmonic maps, when you look at the space of maps and you exploit this, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that it's sort of locally star-shaped and then... Yeah, it's a very similar thing. That's right. Okay, okay cool. Yeah. Okay, should so we, should mm -hmm. we think of these objects as some, as some sort of uh, complexified geodesics or something like that? Ooh, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. Um, well, they are, they are kind of like geodesics. Well, like two-dimensional things, but it, it they become one-dimensional if you consider the complex uh, case. So it's like, uh, I don't know, does this make sense? They're kind of like geodesics in the sense that their images are, you know, are, are minimal submanifolds. Um, but they're satisfying a first-order equation, right? And the geodesic equation is second order. So, uh, so they're kind of, they're, if you want to think of a first-order analog, a calibration in, in, in of, of degree one. You can think of if you had a, if you had a closed, if you had a unit length vector field, whose dual one form was closed, and you look at the integral curves of that. I guess those would be geodesics, right? I guess, um, yeah. So it, it's it's got some some properties that are certainly in common with geodesics, but it's it's really different because it's a first order equation rather than second order. What if you change S2 with some other um, um, orientable um, surface? The, is this energy gap true? Um, I don't know. Darren could tell us, probably. He's in the audience, but I don't think... I don't it's, think any yeah, it's still true. The energy gap is... I mean, yeah, this particular statement, you, you can replace S2 by other closed surfaces. Compact. Compact. Yeah, yeah. yeah closed. Yeah. Closed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the reason I'm, I'm stating it for S2 is because when we talk on the next slide about the compactness modulo bubbling, the bubbles turn out to be S2. So that's why we're stating it like this. Okay. okay thanks. Okay. So uh, next thing is compactness modulo bubbling. I'm not going to read this very carefully because uh, it's not 
super important. But basically, it says if you have a sequence of J-holomorphic maps with uniformly bounded two energy, so the C is independent of K, then uh, there exists a sort of limiting J-holomorphic map um, and a possibly empty finite finite set of points, B, I'll call it for bad points, such that after passing possibly to a subsequence, the following happens. So first of all, this sequence, which was uniformly bounded in two energy, converges to this limiting J-holomorphic map uniformly away from the bad points in C1. And uh, as measures, the energy densities, the two energy densities of the UKs um, go to the to the two energy densities of the uh, two energy density of this limiting uh, J holomorphic map U infinity plus a bunch of Dirac measures or finite uh, uh, point point measures at each of these bad points, these bubble points, uh, with a certain mass which is at least one half epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is the is this threshold energy, the minimum energy that a that a S a map a, whole, a J holomorphic map from S two can have. So the only reason this is a one half is because everything here should be multiplied by half, right? Um, so what this is saying is that the energy density in the limit can concentrate at these bad points where you lose a certain minimum amount of energy each time. And uh, also, if you actually had a uniform LP bound on the DUKs for P strictly bigger than two, then there's no bad points. It doesn't bubble, okay? That's the that's the sort of compactness modulo bubbling. Uh, the the way this is applied is if you had a sequence, let's say, of J holomorphic maps that all represented the same homology class, then remember if they all represent the same homology class and they're all J holomorphic, their energy, their two energy, is this topological number. So it's of course uh, bounded uniformly. They all they all have the same two energy, and so you can use this compactness modulo bubbling to say that up to a a subsequence and away from a finite set of points we get a, a limiting J holomorphic map. And then at each of these bad bubble points, you rescale around the XI, you basically zoom in and use the fact that the equation is conformally invariant to, to get basically a J holomorphic map on an open disk. And then the disk, of course, is the one, uh, if you, if you, it's conformal to the, to S2 minus the point, right, by stereographic projection. And we have a bounded energy thing there and by removal singularities we can extend it to the s2 to the whole s2 so what we get is a bubbled off j holomorphic map with domain equal to s2 and every time we do this if it's a non-constant map a non-trivial map we lose a certain amount of energy by the by the um, uh, energy gap result right and so because of this each time we lose we're losing a, a certain amount of energy so this bubbling will stop after a finite number of iterations. So this we get what's called a bubble tree. You get, you get something that looks kind of like you get a bunch of bubbles coming off of this thing. Anyway, um, I ask a question about item C. Yes. Do you get that by some sort of heat kernel argument, and you just say that a sufficiently uh, not too bad LP energy bounds uniformly the actual uh, L2 energy, and then you use the previous case to argue that there is no bubbling? The, I the... Yeah, I don't remember, actually. Um, that sounds right. Okay. But, but off the top of my head, I can't tell you. Okay, cool. Okay, maybe Darren can. Okay, it's really so, holder. and then, okay. holder? Okay. It's holder, so then, once you have an LP bound, you're in, oh, sorry. Come uh, bubble, hap bubble happens when there's concentration. When you, when you have LP bound for P bigger than two, just by holder, you can control. You get a uniform right. bound on the energy on, on balls. Right. And uh, you can show that there's no concentration. That, that's it. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. These here are more technical. I'm not gonna, I'm, run, I'm running low on time, but basically, what this one says is that you can't get things that look like this. This doesn't happen. You just get bubbles that stick to zero neck length and no energy loss. So I'm, I'm well behind in my time. So let's, let's not worry about these two. So the point is, I'm going to introduce a more general setting now, um, which includes, of course, this almost Kähler setting as a special case. And we're going to define an analog of the J-holomorphic map equation, which will include the J-holomorphic map equation as a special case. 
And the goal is to prove analogs of these theorems in these in these general settings. And when we do, except we have to change some, so we have to change the statement slightly to take into account the, the minor differences. So this is the setting of vector cross products. Um, so let's think about what we had. We had a metric on M, which I called H, and we had this uh, this structure, uh, almost complex structure J, and it had two key properties which which related J with H. The first one is J of V is always orthogonal to V, which I can write as J is skew a joint with respect to H. And the other one is that J of V has the same length as V, which says that J is um, an orthogonal transformation with respect to H. Okay. In fact, these two properties characterize orthogonal complex structures, right? If you have properties one and two, then J squared has to be minus one using the fact that H is non-degenerate. So we're going to define something which is uh, generalizing J. This is this is a classical thing from the late 60s due to Alfred Gray called a vector cross product. And it's defined as follows. So let's take a Riemannian manifold and let's let K be between one and the dimension. Then a K-fold vector cross product on M is a bundle map that's going to take at every point, it's going to take k tangent vectors to m and give you a single tangent vector to m in a skew symmetric way okay so it's going to be it's going to be a k uh, takes k t tangent vectors to one and it's skew symmetric in its arguments and it has two properties which tells us how it interacts with the metric h and they're going to be exactly analogs of this okay so the first property is that if i take the cross product of v1 up to vk then this has to be orthogonal to each of V1 up to VK. And secondly, if I take the cross product of V1 up to VK, its norm is the same as the norm of V1 wedge up to VK. So uh, this says that it preserves length on decomposable elements. Okay. So, um, so by the way, for, uh, for this uh, almost complex structure, this is just the setting where K equals one for, for J. Now it follows from property one that if I take the cross product of k vectors and then take the inner product with a k plus first vector, that this is totally skew symmetric. So this is a k plus one form, an ordinary k plus one form. And it follows from property two that this form has co-mass one. So, uh, so that means that whenever it's closed, it's a calibration. Okay, that's the, this is the pointwise linear algebra property for a calibration and the other global property is that it's closed. So we're not going to necessarily assume that alpha p is closed unless we have to. Okay, so that's perfectly good. It's a vector cross product. We know there exists one because an almost complex structure is a, a vector cross product with k equals one. What about more generally? Well, these have all been classified back uh, when, when uh, Alfred Gray introduced this in the 60s. There are only four types of vector cross products. It's a very constricted. It's a very uh, rigid definition. So these are the types. This is the one we've already seen, an almost complex structure uh, together with a compatible metric. Uh, you can just have an oriented manifold, an oriented Riemannian manifold, and then the Hodge star on n minus 1 vectors, sections of wedge n minus 1 of Tm, is uh, a vector cross product. That's just because the Hodge star is an isometry. And the associated uh, n form there is just the volume form. And then there's these two exceptional uh, vector cross products, which is uh, twofold in seven dimensions and threefold in eight dimensions. This corresponds to a G2 structure and this corresponds to a spin seven structure. So I know many of you know what these are, probably most of you in this audience. If you don't, it doesn't matter. I'm just telling you there's these settings where there are these other vector cross products. And you just, if you just believe that, then you can, under, you can follow the rest of the, of the talk. Um, so in, in type one, this form is the volume form. It's always closed. In type two, it's where we're in the setting we talked about in the first half of the talk. Um, and these, these three and four are called the exceptional vector cross products. Okay. So let's suppose we had a manifold with a vector cross product. Then we have this triple. We have the Riemannian metric H, the K-fold vector cross product, and the associated K plus one form. Then if we take a k plus one dimensional submanifold, we're going to call it p invariant 
if the cross product of k tangent vectors to L is again a tangent vector to L. Okay, so remember the the in the first half of the talk, k was one, so k plus one was two, and then uh, this was just j of T L is contained in T L. So again, just like in the first half, if you have a uh, p invariant submanifold of dimension k plus one, then you can show that it has to be orientable, and there's a choice of orientation so that this k form restricts to the volume form. That's really just the co-mass one condition. And um, we say L is calibrated with respect to alpha p. I'm not, I'm not necessarily assuming alpha p is closed. If it, if it is closed, then from Harvey and Lawson, L would be absolutely volume minimizing in its homology class. So these would be, uh, in the in the G2 case, these are called associative submanifolds. In the spin-7 case, they're called Cayley submanifolds. We already saw these at the beginning of the talk. And this case is not so interesting because these would have to be n-dimensional submanifolds, so they're just open subsets. Okay, so these are the four classes of vector cross products. They have special submanifolds. Remember what we did at the beginning of the talk, we talked about uh, the almost Kähler setting and we had the special submanifolds, but then we talked about the special class of maps whose images, when they were well behaved, at the points where they were well behaved, those images were the special submanifolds. Oh, this is a remark that you guys know anyway. Um, so now we're going to talk about these special special cl classes of maps. This we're going to call them Smith maps. I'll tell you why in a minute. But let me motivate a little bit more. So why why should we care about uh, this equation, which I haven't shown you yet. So there's a program of Donaldson, Thomas, and Siegel that proposes that there should exist similar invariants to the gromov witten invariants by counting um, associative submanifolds in G2 manifolds, when phi is closed, when the three form is closed, or Cayley submanifolds of spin seven manifolds when the four form is closed. Okay? So, I mean, there's a whole... This is, you know, people have been have been thinking about this now for well over 15 years, and, and some progress has been made, and it's still a huge amount of work to be done. Um, but there's there's lots of analogies in three in seven and eight dimensions with these special geometric structures, and lots of analogies with the symplectic picture. Right? So people are trying to generalize things as much as possible. So way back now, 10 years ago, Aaron Smith introduced a nonlinear first-order PDE that generalized the J-holomorphic map equation to these settings, to the associative and the Cayley, and, and also the Hodge star, but we're not going to... That one's a bit simple. We're not going to talk about that one. So Aaron was a PhD student of Jonathan Block at UPenn. His thesis was on something totally different, on the Riemann-Hilbert correspondence. He was really an algebraic geometer in some sense. Uh, but he did this sort of on the side, and it was this that interested me, and that's why I hired him as a postdoc at Waterloo, and then we were going to think about it a bit more. He ended up moving to San Francisco and, and making video games, and he's a lot happier than maybe some of us are. Uh, so he left math, and I didn't touch it again until about three years ago when Jesse and Darren got interested in this, and, and we, uh, we came back to it. So let me tell you what the equation is. So let's have a manifold with a Riemannian metric, a k-fold vector cross product, and then the associated k plus 1 form. And let's let n be k plus 1. So remember, when k was 1, then n was 2, and we looked at surfaces. So now we're going to take an n-dimensional, compact-oriented manifold with a conformal structure, a conformal class of metrics. And this is just a CO plus NR structure. Now when N is bigger than 2, there's no nice isomorphism of this Lie group to some other, some other Lie group. Here's our, here's our definition. So we take a look at a map from this N manifold with this conformal structure and orientation into this target. And so DU is as before. And now we look at the N minus first exterior power of DU. That's going to go from sections of lambda N minus 1 of T sigma to sections of lambda n minus 1 of u star tm. And we say it's a Smith map if the following equation is satisfied. So this looks pretty ugly. Ignore this conformal, in fact, ignore this whole factor for, for the time being. This is just some function, okay? It says 
that if you apply uh, lambda n minus 1 of du and then take the cross product of those n minus 1 vectors, n minus 1 is k, it's the same as first taking the Hodge star on those n minus 1 vectors to get, to get one vector, and then applying du to that. So this guy and this guy map from the same domain to the same target. It's not quite just this. We have this, this extra piece here. And you can see when n is 2, all of this goes away. Okay, And you get the J-holomorphic map equation because this also goes away and P, P is J when n is 2. And again, remember, we only had a conformal class of metrics on the domain, but this combination, this, nor this power of the norm together with the Hodge star, this is conformally invariant on lambda n minus 1 of T sigma. So it doesn't depend on the choice of representative. Okay, let me just quickly show you the equation in local coordinates. It really says that if you take uh, k, if you take n minus one vectors, tangent vectors, and you uh, uh, push them forward by du, and then take their cross product, it's the same as first wedging them together and taking the star. Remember, this is this is a type one uh, type one vector cross product on n because it's just using the Hodge star on on lambda n minus one. So if you if you take the Hodge star and then apply du, so so this is a vector cross product, and this is a vector cross product. So it's really saying that du commutes with the, these two vector cross products up to some function. And it turns out, so you can think of this as saying that the Smith map is conformally vector cross product preserving. It turns out that the the rigidity of vector cross products forces this function to be this. We have no hope, no choice. It has to be that that ugly function. Um, this is what it looks like in normal in, in local coordinates. I'm, I'm kind of running low on time, so I'll go fast. These are the associative Smith and the Cayley Smith. You can see now that it's fully nonlinear, right? You get uh, on the left hand side is some, uh, well, they're both sides are fully nonlinear because you have a, a power of du here and then one derivative, and then this is quadratic or cubic in, in the first derivatives. So these are fully nonlinear equations, first order equations. And as I said, this, the way I've written them here, they, they, they seem to depend on the metric G, but this combination together with this uh, is independent of the choice of conformal, of, of representative. Okay, so geometric properties. As before, if you uh, pre-compose by orientation preserving conformal diffeomorphism, it takes solutions to solutions. If you have a Smith map, if you have a solution to that equation, then the pullback of the target metric is this factor, uh, sorry, this should be an n. Oh, no, yeah, this should be an n. n. Um, so that that combination, norm of du to the n times g sigma, is uh, is conformally invariant, is independent of the choice of representative. So again, all these Smith maps are weakly conformal maps. So there, are, there could be points where du vanishes, and at the points where it doesn't vanish, it's a conformal injection. Um, Again, you have a set of critical points away from the critical points. It's an immersion, and its image is calibrated with respect to alpha p. So in the G2 case, the image will be associative. In the spin 7 case, the image will be Cayley. But now we don't know anything really about the structure of this critical set. It's certainly not expected to be a discrete set of points. It's probably going to be way more complicated. Um, I'll say maybe more about that in the end. Just as an aside, here's another way of rewriting the Smith equation. It's equivalent. Oh, no, maybe this is a 2. Sorry, this is a 2. It's not an n. This is a 2. Um, another way to write the Smith equation is that it's uh, weakly conformal and weakly conformally calibrating. So it pulls back the calibration form on the target to the calibration form on the domain. And that's the calibration form associated to the Hodge star vector cross product. Okay, I've got maybe five minutes. Let me talk about the energy identity. So if you have any smooth map from sigma n to m, you can prove, this was in Smith's preprint, you can prove that if you pull back uh, the calibration form by u, then point-wise, this is less than or equal to this uh, expression. And again, this guy is independent of the choice of representative of the, of the conformal class. This is, again, linear algebra, but it's much more involved. Um, when n is bigger than 2. So it uses the Hadamard inequality twice, sort of two different versions of the Hadamard inequality. It uses the calibration inequality, it uses Cauchy-Schwartz. It's still just a page, 
but it's not you know one line like before. Um, so again, now if alpha p is closed, then this this thing is topological. It's it's again this pairing of the homology class of the image of sigma with the cohomology class of alpha p. So it follows from this point-wise inequality, if we integrate both sides and using this, this topological um, characterization, that a Smith map will minimize the n energy in its homology class. So the n energy, I probably want to put a one over n here. The n energy is the ln norm of du, okay? Or it's to the power n. Um, and it follows, therefore, that if we, since it, since the Smith map will minimize the n energy in its homology class, it's a critical point, and therefore satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equations of that, and that's the n harmonic map equation, which is the following, right? So it's still um, it's still uh, quasi-linear, second order, but now it's not uniformly elliptic; it's degenerate elliptic because of this factor, norm of du to the n minus two. Okay. Um, so, so it'll, the ellipticity fails at the critical points where du equals zero. Um, let's, let's talk about that. Okay, so now let's get to the, our theorem because I've got three minutes. So our theorem, I, I stated as one theorem, right? But there's many theorems in the paper. Um, suitably modified versions of those seven uh, analytic properties continue to hold for Smith maps in all in all four cases, right? For any vector cross product, it's not really these are not really results about uh, J holomorphic maps. They're results about vector cross product conformally, conformally vector cross product preserving maps. So uh, let me say something that the, the techniques that are used to establish the properties in N equals two, they, many of the techniques, they don't carry, o carry over to the higher dimensional setting for two reasons. One is uh, because this, this uh, critical locus, the set of uh, points where du vanishes, might not be, in, it's probably not just a discrete set. Nobody really knows what it is. Um, so that, that makes things more, more problematic because we don't know that these maps are immersions except for a discrete set. The set where they fail to be immersions could be much worse. And again, as what I said on the previous slide, the n-harmonic map equation is not uniformly elliptic. It's, a, it's degenerate elliptic when n is bigger than 2. So these are the two main analytic problems. Um, the way we deal with the problem one, what happened to my laser pointer? Okay. The way we deal with problem one is by, instead of applying minimal surface results or, or, or a geometric measure theory to the image, we work directly with the N energy of the maps. Okay. So that's, this is not a huge problem. And we don't really care about the image so much as, we, as the map itself. Um, for the second problem, the fact that the, the anharmonic map equation is degenerate, um, while we use a lot of previous work on anharmonic maps that, that deal with this degeneracy, so Darren is the expert of the three of us on that, um, but there's one, there's one thing that the existing uh, literature on anharmonic maps uh, didn't have that we needed. We needed to know that uh, if you had a weak W1N solution, then it would be continuous. And this is only known in full generality for n equals 2. There are some results when n is not equal to 2, but they all require some additional assumptions that, that we couldn't fit into our setting. Right? So we couldn't use that. But luckily, we had Darren, uh, because what we did is we used the special structure of the Smith equation. So specifically, the Smith equation has what's called a compensation phenomenon. So this has been observed in lots of other geometric PDEs, including n maps into targets. So basically by the special structure of the equation, you can you can you know you can do this. Uh, I'm running out of time. I'm, I, I really am out of time. So let me just show you the results in one more minute. okay? The only thing that changes, these are going to be the exact same seven theorems I, I wrote before, but now the changes are going to be in blue. And most of the changes are that twos become ends, okay? So you have the mean value inequality exactly as before, just that all the twos become ends. Interior regularity, this is a little different. So the two became an n, but now we can't conclude C infinity. We can just conclude C1 beta, older, older space. And that's because of the degeneracy of the n-harmonic map equation. We, we don't expect to get better than that. Um, 
Removable singularities as before. Basically, if it's if it's got finite n energy on a punctured ball, you can extend it. There's still an energy gap for the round n sphere. Um, this is again used to show finite number of bubbles. It's exactly the same compactness modulo bubbling is exactly the same, except all the, the twos become n's. If you're wondering, and maybe some of you are, that associates should bubble along curves and ask me after the talk. Um, so this is exactly the same with all the ends becoming twos. Um, and this is exactly the same, the no energy loss and zero neck length. So this is the last slide. What can we do in the future? Well, there's lots of things we can do. So uh, one is, can we prove a general existence theorem for solutions to the Smith equation? So there are known examples, of course. If you take an associative or a Cayley submanifold of a G2 or a spin 7 manifold, then the inclusion map is a Smith map, right? But it's hard to find these kinds of compact submanifolds. So it might be easier to find them by, by establishing some existence for the Smith equation and then knowing that the image of the Smith, the Smith map would be one of these special submanifolds. Can we desingularize a calibrated submanifold using a Smith map? So what do I mean by that? Suppose you had an associative or a Cayley with singularities. Can we exhibit it as the image of a Smith map that has critical points? So to, to do this, you really have to understand more about what is the structure of this set sigma C, the critical points of, of a Smith map, and that's not at all understood. And finally, what is the deformation theory of Smith maps? Is it maybe better behaved than the deformation theory of calibrated submanifolds? So this is something I'm very interested in. We know that associatives and Cayleys have bad deformation theories. Right? You, in general, the deformation is obstructed. Uh, if you wanted to deform through smooth associatives or smooth Cayleys, right? But here's a, here's a fantasy I have. Suppose you have a smooth associative or a Cayley, you find a way to exhibit it as the image of a Smith map, and then instead of deforming the submanifold, you deform the Smith map. And then you look at this family of deformations of the Smith map, and you look at their images, and their images may be deformations of that associative or Cayley, but through things that have singularities, right? That's possible. So these are uh, just a bunch of things that we can we can work on for the future. And I'm sorry I went three minutes over, but I'll stop here. Well thanks. worth it. That's thanks to speaker, please. <laughs> Have we got any questions for Spiro? Don't be shy. Otherwise, you guys know what's going to happen. I'm going to start with my own questions, and we're going to be here forever. So <laughs> try and stop me. So, Spiro, did I understand correctly that these uh, Smith functions, they satisfy some differential equation, and they're also characterized as uh, minimizers or local minimizers for this energy function? Well, yeah, they are. They are local minimizers for the N energy. Um, so every Smith map is a local minimum but not the other way around. Not the not the other way. Well, I mean, p possibly with uh, with certain additional hypotheses, right? That's something we are thinking about. Under what additional hypotheses on the target geometry could it be that any stable um, and harmonic map has to be Smith, right? In general, right. that's true, but under certain conditions, it might be true. And this compactness uh, properties are true for every. Uh, local minimizers of the energy function, or, or just for the Smith, uh, for the Smith. Well, maps. we use the Smith equation very heavily, so uh, okay, probably not true for any minimizer. Yeah. I see. So it's not just a, an abstract sobble of uh, space. Uh, no, the, the, I, I, sort of, I went very quickly there because because um, I was running out of time. But the point is that we use the structure of the equation very uh, crucially so and that doesn't mean it won't be true more generally but but we definitely use the smith equation we just we didn't just use that these are uh, also in harmonic maps that wasn't enough okay i understand so looking as so i should be looking at people but i have these two devices and i can see you here no, no, of course. Yeah, no, here. no problem <laughs> let's see cool uh, are you good, Paolo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me just re remind everyone uh, that if you wish to subscribe to our mailing list uh, or to be advised over WhatsApp for future talks, uh, you can find the instructions on the chat. There you go. As well as uh, uh, check 
our previously recorded talks on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, Spiro, I, I have so many questions. I should probably just apply for a PhD at Waterloo or something, but, uh, <laughs> but, but maybe for, for today, um, I'm trying to think of some semi-trivial training grounds for this theory. So in particular, all three words, uh, all three worlds uh, 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 collide uh, in one setup that comes to my mind, right? So if you think of a, you think of a, this this Sasakian context of say, uh, take a weighted projective Calabiao, it has a natural hop vibration, uh, a Calabiao threefold, it, it has a natural hop vibration, uh, which is seven dimensional, and then the cone over it is an eight dimensional manifold. Now, What's going to happen is that, from the point of view of some manifolds, uh, J holomorphic curves on the Calabiao, uh, and indeed uh, uh, special Lagrangians on the Calabiao, uh, will induce uh, associative some manifolds on the Sasaki manifold, right? So, in, in the pre images, the vibrations over the holomorphic curves will be associative, and the horizontal lifts of, the, of, the, uh, of a special Lagrangian are going to be associative as well. Furthermore, the cones over these are going to be Cayley manifolds. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think in, in this particular setting when all three worlds collide, you can kind of check the predictions for associatives in Cayley manifolds in the seven and eight dimensional uh, settings uh, just by using the fact that some of them converge just because they are uh, 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 secretly J holomorphic curves. Mm -hmm. For which you already have a well understood uh, gram of compactness theory. Mm -hmm. And then any other uh, 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 special uh, um, calibrated submanifold, um, you, could, you could try and describe them as def definitions of these, and then hopefully, hopefully also understand them uh, you know, as de definitions of th those which stem from original uh, J holomorphic curves. Uh, uh, I don't know if that's all of them, but that's, that's quite a few. Um, does this make sense? So then you could you could actually in this setup you could actually compare all three theories. Uh, that's a that's a lot you just told me. It takes me a while to un it'll take me a while to unpack. But I think I think you're trying to say so you you have you have a situation where you have in the same in the same setup you have. J holomorphic curves. You have you have associatives. You have Cayleys, yeah. and you want to compare these. Maybe the associated Smith maps of all of these and the convergence. Exactly. This probably related to what I was sort of hinting you should ask me about, which is this this here. So when we when we posted the preprint, there was two or three people who were concerned that there must be something wrong because it didn't kind of agree with their intuition. And so let me let me just take this one slide and explain that because it might it might answer partially what you're asking me. So what our theorem yeah. says is that if you have a sequence of associative Smith maps with uniformly bounded three energy, they bubble only at points, right? Mm -hmm. The bad set, the bubbling set is still a, a finite set of points, and we know that a sequence of uh, J holomorphic maps with uniformly bounded two energy only bubbles at points, but if you have a complex submanifold of a Calabi-Yau and you cross it with a circle, that's an associative submanifold of, of Y times S1, of the G2 yeah. manifold. Yeah. So people were saying, well, that means if if uh, if J holomorphic maps bubble at points and you take a J holomorphic map crossed with a circle, you get you get an associative, uh, sorry, J holomorphic curve crossed with a circle, you get an associative, then associatives should be bubbling along curves. Right? Yeah. That's what this intuition tells us. But uh, what we show in the paper is that if you had a sequence of associative Smith maps that's going to converge, so you need a uniform bound on the three energy. So if you had a, a uniform uh, sequence of associative Smith maps from sigma 2 times S1 to Y6 times S1 with uniformly bounded three energy, and if you wanted to construct this from a sequence Vn from sigma 2 to Y6 of J holomorphic maps, then it turns out the Vn's also have uniformly bounded three energy, not two. And therefore, mm -hmm. by the part which you asked me about at the beginning, the VNs do not bubble, right? So if you can construct a, a sequence 
of associatives that's really coming from J-holomorphic maps with the right bound so that it would bubble, then the VNs, in fact, wouldn't bubble at all. The, the J-holomorphic maps wouldn't bubble at all, and there'd be no bubbling here. So it's not a contradiction to this, this intuition, right? What one could argue that maybe the maybe this is what we want to happen, and then therefore the Smith map might not be the right equation. That's a that's a fair argument to make. But with the Smith map uh, setting, it does not produce a contradiction to this because you can never construct a, a sequence of associated Smith maps from a sequence of J holomorphic Smith maps, which would which would bubble here, but not you know if if it if it if you construct it with a uniform three energy bound, then there wouldn't be any bubbling anyway if it came from a lower order construction because you'd have a three energy bound on that. So, I don't know, that's kind of a cheating way to answer your question because it's not at all what you asked me, but this is a setting where you have two of the players in the same in the same setting and you can't just compare the two things because, because of the fact that you need this L N energy bound and N depends on the dimension of the domain. Right. So, and and if you had a, if you had an m dimensional domain with a, with an n energy bound where n is bigger than m, you don't get any bubbling. Wow. Uh, so this is a local version of what I asked you, right? Because because what I, what I what I was the, the 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 cases I was considering would be non-trivial circle vibrations over y six. Mm -hmm. So this would be a local picture. So indeed, if you're looking at if you're doing the 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 local analysis, trying to buy out, control the energy over over bowls, uh, this would indeed be the model situation. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I think you can do slightly more than this is by considering, say, associative uh, uh, submanifolds or or Cayley, you know, just calibrated submanifolds, which are deformations of these fellows, right? Mm -hmm. so we, we, we know the deformation theory of associatives, for instance, is governed by this um, Fueta operator, for instance, yeah. right? So, so you, you could start with these as sort of base point, uh, sort of reference points, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which uh, correspond to maps that indeed don't bubble at all because they're induced by homomorphic curves. Right. However, you could then consider uh, calibrated deformations of these, which will give you a more general fellows for which you know you right you right, have, right? So, so these would be genuine uh uh uh, uh calibrate some manifolds which are not inherited from uh, some some data on the but if you app. start uh, let's say you start with an associative that's an s1 times a times a complex of manifold and yeah. you deform it as an associative yeah doesn't it have to stay of that special form or can it can it change I think that sounds like section two of a paper. I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you have to, uh, because you, you'd have to look at what the what, what the vibration is. If the if if the manifold is a calabial times a circle globally, then we know it's true. But then if, if oh, it's I not, see. then you have to look. I see. I see. Yeah. Look at what the submersion is. Yeah. Okay. Right? And then, but my point is, all three types of animals. So two, three, and four. Uh, 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 you know, cross products. I mean, one, two, and three uh, uh, type cross products would exist in the same setting, mm -hmm. and then you'd be able, you would have three Smith equations, three Smith mm -hmm. Smith map equations, that sort of relate to each other, but you can, but they sort of fit in concentric domains, right? You could you could have mm -hmm. uh, map holomorphic curves into associatives, and then look at deformations of those. But for each of those deformations, you could look at the Cayley guys over the cone. And and look at deformations of those, uh, and so. But on the cone, the Cayleys, the Cayleys won't be compact, right? Ah, oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, they, I'm, sure, I'm sure some version of this will will hold in the non-compact setting, but it'll be much harder, probably. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm I, what what I think is that these, if if you look at the setup of weighted projective Calabial three folds, which come naturally with with a hop vibration and all this narrative, um. This could be kind of training grounds for the theory, you know, just just making it work in a concrete setup in which you have reasonable expectations because they have analogies with a J holomorphic setup in an explicit way. Definitely. I mean, I got to read your paper now, but I. I have I'll, I'll apply for Waterloo in September, and then. Okay. Good. Thank you for that. I'll I'll take a look. 
I'm super interested in this uh, for other reasons as well. So, so if, if you can spare any time, that would be great. Um, sure. Guys, uh, 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 have you got any more questions for Spiro? Then if not, let's thank him again. Great talk. All right. Um, thank you, Spiro. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely weekend. Uh, and uh, Spiro,